Firstly, um, I would just like to remind everybody that we are going to be recording this session for playback later. So my name is Gail Bogue, I'm Dean of the Business School, and I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome our speaker, Mr. Keo Chia. Mr. Keo is a director of Grace Financial Limited, which is a Hong Kong family business, where he focuses on direct and private equity investment programmes. He started his career with Hewlett Packard in Scotland and Asia Pacific, and then at Apple Asia. And today, he brings 40 years of diverse experience, largely as a venture capitalist with Walden International, which is a US Asia venture capital um, private equity company, as well as undertaking an entrepreneurial journey with a successful technology startup. Keo serves as president of Hong Kong Venture Capital and Private Equity Association, advisory member on the School of Continuing Studies at Chinese University of Hong Kong, advisor to the Entrepreneurship Fund at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and on the board of Versatech, University of Hong Kong's technology transfer company. Previously, Keo has served as chairman of advisory committee at Hong Kong Baptist University, board member of Hong Kong Government's Technology Hub, and committee member of Hong Kong Community Investment and Inclusion Fund to seed social capital projects for community revival. So as you will see from his extensive experience, his current passion is in impact investments, where he attempts to bring together venture capital investment discipline with an entrepreneurial approach to projects for sustainability. Over the years, he's trained, coached, mentored and empowered the next generation. And he is an alumnus of Edinburgh Napier University, as well as Strathclyde and Sheffield. He's a fellow of the Hong Kong Institute of Directors and a global Scot. And today I'm absolutely delighted he has taken time out of his very busy schedule to join us. So welcome, Keo, and I'd now like to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, for the introduction, for the kind introduction. Indeed, um, my affiliation with Scotland goes way, way back, and uh, it's a really a great pleasure to be able to come back to Scotland um, virtually um, to kind of share some of my thoughts on uh, what we call today the new normal. Uh, as you can see on my background, it's actually a picture of Hong Kong. Unfortunately, it's late in the evening here, it's 6.30. I couldn't show you the actual view from, uh, from the background, but this, this will do for the time being. Um, today, what I'm trying to uh, do is really to um, talk about three things. Really, the first one is why this, uh, why we call the new normal? What has uh, this COVID-19, uh, why is it different from the rest? And having been through the, the umpteen number of uh, crises, why is this different? How then, therefore, as I reflect on this, um, this whole pandemic, what were the reflections that I was having with, and what were some of the things, my conclusions that came back and says, what this going forward is going to look like. And I'll share some of my thoughts. I'm going to talk about 20, 25 minutes and uh, I'm going to open for questions and feel free, uh, post any questions and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and answer those as, as, uh, as best as we can. And feeling that uh, I know Ron uh, and Gail have my uh, email address so you can send me an a, a email or I'm available on LinkedIn too. Now, when I looked at the the whole, over the last 40 years, and uh, for, uh, uh, for my accent, you probably guess that I'm, I'm, some of you may try to guess where I'm from. I'm actually born in Malaysia. Uh, so it's a cross-cultural environment um, and multilingual environment. Um, but I spent significant time in the UK, spent 10 years there, it caused too much trouble with the Scottish when I was working in Scotland. So. Uh, the firm that I worked with was an American company. They sent me back to Asia. So I've done a, quite a bit of things throughout that time. I worked for Hewlett Packard in Scotland and then came back and continued to work for HP and then worked for Apple, then did an entrepreneurial stint before becoming a venture capitalist. So my discussion and my um, uh, uh, comments were straddled across from operating side, from an entrepreneurial experience, as well as from an investment perspective. Um, having 
if I trace back since uh, the mid 70s when I graduated, I know it was a long time ago. Um, I count there are like 15 different uh, crises that I've encountered from the oil crisis in the 70s to the recessions in the 90s uh, to the 80s, the, the, the Black Monday in 87, um, to then the, the dot com boom and the dot com bust, uh, and then 9 11, SARS in Hong Kong, the 97 financial crisis. Uh, Asian financial crisis, then the two eight financial global financial crisis, and I saw, wow, why why is this one so different? And the main thing I came to conclusion was really the following. In the past, most of the um, the crisis was mostly mostly economic or financial, but this one is more than that. It impacts is the health. And there's a lot of more unknowns, like the fears, the cures, um, and the complete shutdown of the economy from transportation, all the service industries, health, and everything else uh, got impacted throughout the world. So this isn't just a one dimension, it's a multi-dimension scenario. And resulting from that, there's a lot of disruption from a global scale particularly in the past when we talk about um, globalization. And globalization was really, and Tom Friedman's uh, the book, um, The World is Flat, says um, you pick the place where it's the, the, the cheapest for you to make the things and you ship it all to the other places and that's where your economic value uh, can be maximized of your product and services. But Globalization in this context was totally, totally disrupted because supply chains got totally torn apart. Um, and, and we also saw that um, markets that were evolved, particularly developed markets like the US and Europe, uh, was more evolved from a manufacturing base to become a service base and the manufacturing will move to most lower cost areas. And that created a problem because when you disrupt the whole supply chain, oops, all of a sudden you, 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 you have supply issues. So you see flaws in the entire system in that context. Now, currently people are talking about, and this is one of the new normal that has changed, is that talking about deglobalization. So the first thing is I see is people are talking about deglobalization. And this deglobalization, what does it mean? Meaning that certain strategic items needs to go back to the where the region is made. So in the shipment process, it will not be as disrupted as what we see today. The heavy reliance on your supply chain to make something in one location and ship it globally um, is now no longer uh, being thought about as a good idea. So the thoughts of second sourcing, regionalization, um, and in regionalization, your supply chain and everything else will become around a manufacturing of a cluster, become a cluster effect. That the globalization have accelerated in that context. I saw this in somewhat in uh, during SARS in 2003, where uh, some of the countries were looking at, oh, we need to second source some of our uh, products and services because if one country gets hit, the second country will still have. Uh, uh, a supply coming through. So this deglobalization evolving towards what I call deglobalization. Of course, you also have the effect of the geopolitical issues that comes about. So moving forward, I see that deglobalization means, and some people coin a word called vertical globalization, <laughs> meaning that it, it will be structured in regions, right? You have in the European bloc, the North American bloc and Asian bloc, each having their own intra-region um, servicing products and services, as well as manufacturing that supplies around those blocks. So I see that going to happen. So whether it's in investments or whether it's in a new strategy or way of thinking, that would happen in the long run. That's how things will evolve. So to me, that's businesses that have gone globalized start to go deglobalize. Um, that leads to one of the 
new normal that I see will happen. The second thing is technology. Not that we do not know that technology um, has accelerated and is permeating across all industries and sector. The very fact that you are holding an iPhone uh, with you or an Android phone, this in itself is a computer. It's a massively fast computer. I still remember half the power of this iPhone was the, of a computer that I used to use when I was in engineering school back in Sheffield, was the size of a building. Today is in your hand. This has enabled the entire technology sphere that building products and services based on technology become a lot, lot easier. So therefore, uh, that leads to a very interesting situation that entrepreneurship becomes a very interesting play because you can launch your own product to an app, whereas your back end is all taken care of by that powerful machine on your hand. It becomes a very interesting scenario. So to me, that's, um, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people talk about entrepreneurship now as the next wave is not because of entrepreneurship, it's the ease of jumping onto the bandwagon of being an entrepreneur because the barrier of entry is much lower. Like for instance, if you want to do a video app or, or, or some, something similar, WebEx have a platform, Zoom have a platform. So for me to be Zoom ready, it's $150 per year US. In the past, impossible with $150. I still remember when we funded WebEx, when I was a venture capitalist, and a lot of you guys don't know that. <laughs> it was a US company, and it took a ton of effort to build what they have today before they got sold to Cisco. We took the company public, and it was part of us like, whoa, this is, this is cool. Um, Today, it's now more older technology, as per se. Whereas Zoom has become the next wave of the technology play. So these are things that are changing and accelerating. And that accelerating of technology that permeates all the different industries that you can see of, where we talk about artificial intelligence, big data. To me, big data and artificial intelligence are 20 years old. They used to be called data mining during my days. But it's only commercially viable today. Why? The processing power, Moore's law, has doubled the computing power, lowered the cost at a speed that is so fast that that makes what is possible today impossible in the past. So resulting from that is Data becomes what I call, and someone call, call it the new oil. You have to mine it, you have to dig it, you have to discover it. And that becomes the most valuable of next generation of companies. It's how you manage data and data uh, in a structured manner, very similar to mining oil or digging, drilling oil. Now, technology has both its good side and its bad side. And we have to be careful on that. A lot of people talk about um, uh, EV, uh, electric cars, and says, oh, that's going to save the environment, there's no pollution. But does anybody ever ask the question, your battery actually emits radiation? So if you don't do a proper job of shielding it, the battery underneath your car will fry your butt. Nobody talks about that. So let's be careful. Same thing when people talk about 3G, 4G, our homes, we have Wi-Fi, we have 3G, we have 4G, we have our headphones beside our bed, that's radiation, my dear friends. Um, and you have 5G, more radiation. 
unfortunately, not many people talk about things like that. So there's a balance of these two uh, that we need to be aware of. And, and I bring this up so that people are conscious of it because the impact on society, the community becomes uh, 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 a serious consideration too. Obviously with COVID, guess what? Healthcare sector became a hot thing. So that has, healthcare sector have always been in the background, but now has put into the front seat. And healthcare um, is gaining a lot of attention. So for me, the potential for investment and opportunities there is humongous. Now, healthcare is very siloed. If you look into the medical field, the neuroscientists, the neurosurgeon will never talk to the radiologist, nor the dermatologist, nor the optometrist. It's been so siloed. Now people are saying, hey, can I not use some of the techniques in neurology to do look at performance, to predict diseases, to look at your brain uh, function, and all that crossing that medical professions between to cut down these silos. So that's a whole movement there. They're thinking about that uh, and, and try to break down those barriers. Then researchers that are in biology department uh, and the chemistry department in the physics department, in the medical department, can they not come together to exchange some of the thoughts and the research that have been done? And if you look at Stanford University, four or five years ago, they put a, a whole floor. They put an engineer, a, a chemist, a biologist, a physicist, a medical doctor, all sitting on the same floor so they can exchange and cross exchange ideas. That is going to lead to new discoveries and new way of doing things using old methods or methods that are done in one discipline cross into another discipline. So resulting from that is I see then cross-sector, cross-sector training become a very, very strategic going forward, particularly in the field of uh, education, in uh, colleges, in universities. No longer you major in one discipline, you cross-sector. And I've seen that Edinburgh and Napier have done that. In your business school, you have a, a collection of different, seemingly not related, but because you, you go into a hotel school, but you learn law, you learn other things, marketing others, because when you walk out into the business world, you need all that. And to me, that's uh, uh, epitomized the future of what education will look like. The very fact we are doing this webinar online signifies another technology breakthrough. That in the past, I got to travel to Scotland to be in the classroom to present this. Now I could do it sitting in my home, 8,000 miles away to do this. And that cross pollination of ideas, regions uh, uh, can become reality today things that you never could imagine. So some of the assumptions that we'll make in the past can be broken down, can be almost relearned. And if I take the, um, a, a saying from Alvin Toffler, he says, um, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn unlearn and relearn. This is Alvin Toffler. And this was a guy that I knew or heard of when I was at Edinburgh and Napier. When a professor brought this up, he says, he's a futurist. He predicts what the future looks like. And his quote is so dear to what I'm, I've been experiencing. You got to unlearn, you got to strip off all your old stuff and relearn so that you can move forward. Resulting from that, I also see another issue. Because of all these um, uh, uh, changes in the environment that, um, that we're seeing, crowding of animal habitation, um, uh, farm factories for, 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 for food, um, that factory farms for food, using too much antibiotics, um, 
all this is leading to a different issue that's going to evolve. And some people will say has already gone overboard. It's a biological and ecological implications. And this was best described in a book called Spillover by David Quammen, who described this biological and ecological disaster that's going to be looming upon us because we are messing with the environment too much and crowding out nature. And some people say that is probably leading to some of the issues with COVID, uh, that, 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 that there is no um, boundary or whatsoever. Plastic pollution, uh, over cultivation of using pesticides uh, and chemical fertilizers, heavy metals in land and all those things, all these are part and parcel of this whole ecological and bi uh, biological issues. Um, water table depletion and all these are part and parcel of that whole scheme of things. So you can see new opportunities coming through, new businesses that will come and solve those, those kind of issues. That leads me to a very interesting thing, disruptive business models. The young people, because of the entrepreneurial uh, barrier has come down with the power of processing and computing, then you really evolve into new things, new business models. You're seeing this in e-commerce, e-learning, e-communication, e-health, e-logistics, last mile delivery. All these things are changing in such a rapid speed um, that you see uh, what you call, in fact, you, uh, some people are talking about the recovery is going to be a K curve. That means there are some industries that go up, there's some industries that will slide down, and you can see that. In the airlines, hotels, is sliding down. The ones that are going up are the ones that are the E something. So, and as a result, entrepreneurs uh, or even established companies today need to really consider whether they are up one or the down issues. I also see the emergence of, because we are people, we are relational. I also see emergence of community-based business, um, catering for neighborhood needs. Uh, throughout the COVID-19, there's a company called Nextdoor that basically um, is an app that can, within the community can sign up that says, hey, I need help. I need someone to, uh, might could be an elderly, that says, I need help to buy some food. Then the next door neighbor says, no problem, I will take care of it for you. So without even having to talk, go across the, 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 to the neighborhood to talk to someone. But by doing that, you're creating what I call a community-based business, or I need someone to babysit for my little boy. And someone says, hey, I need uh, 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 another baby, a uh, little boy to play with my boy. That become a community-based scenario. So, and that leads me to, how do you then manage what I call community impact? And some of the things that are done in the past, like for instance, uh, we invested in a real estate play in, uh, in, uh, in England. We took a very old building, transform it, a hundred year old building, transform it into the most modern building with high speed bandwidth. But one of the things we did was in the coffee shop, in the co-working space that we put in into the, uh, into the ground floor, instead of hiring um, a coffee shop uh, a company to just bring in coffee and things like that. We deliberately went on hire a company that employ ex-convicts. That you're making a difference in someone's life. You're giving someone else a second chance. And to me, that is very meaningful. That's more impactful than someone says, oh, I, I clean up the rivers because you're making a difference in someone's life. To me, impact investing, community investing is almost one and the same. It is not about uh, coming up with a new way of doing things, but it's more of how you make a difference in someone's life. We invested in a brand in a, in a developing country. And according to a lot of uh, um, uh, um, financial models and things like that, they have a huge piece of land. 
the manufacturing was mediocre, it was family run, we could have shut down the manufacturing, sell the piece of land, we make the money. And audios, we fire everyone in the manufacturing, outsource everything. But we did not do that. We upgrade the manufacturing, we enhance the supply chain, we employ the community people, but it took longer. But we say, never mind, it's okay. Because you are creating a community. You are enhancing, making a difference in the life of a village, of a small city. That kind of thinking will accelerate because the next generation of entrepreneurs are much younger than we are, that I am at least. And in speaking to young people, they have that vision. And all they need is for someone to push them and catalyze them. And they'll get that. To me, that's, I see the future. And that's why social enterprise, social impact, uh, community-based uh, 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 investments, will become something that will be interesting for a lot of investments. But it needs a lot of thought through of different way of doing things and different way of um, um, and switching business models to allow you to be um, different with the rest of the world. You know, when I was reflecting this, one of the things that I say is, now you, I talk about a lot of the changes and it's very confusing, but actually some things don't change. Our values, our human values, our purpose of life, family is core, relationships. Where we're so busy running around on, the, on what I call a, 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 a cartwheel or the rat race, we forgot that relationships are actually important. And during this whole COVID situation, it actually allows us to reflect that says, really, relationships are even more important because they're now cooked up together in the home with your kids, with your spouse. Um, and then that's what we are here for. That's what life is all about. Um, so to me, that, that something was really, really hit me like a rock in, in some ways. Um, and that personal realizations was really when you build companies into the future, it's not about the products and services. It's about leadership. It's about culture. It's about leaders being human, exhibiting humility, compassion, empowerment. It's the gener generosity, helping others, giving back. Um, and my son will call it resource allocation uh, or resource redistribution. Um, and along the way, you discover who you are. And profitability is not about just shareholders. It's about the stakeholders. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Kiel, thank you. That was a, a fascinating talk. and. Um, you touched on quite a number of trends there, so we've got a few questions that are coming through. But um, first one is, uh, do you think that the future entrepreneur will be less profit-driven and more balanced? You, you talked about the social giving and caring and, and social enterprises. Is, is that, do you see the, that as the driving force for the um, businesses that are coming to you as a potential investor? Well, the way I see it is, it's not about the, just the profitability and the impact. It will be balanced, but it's the disruptive nature of uh, the business that will allow it to be very profitable. Uh, give you a case in point. Um, you guys know about Uber, right? Yeah. Um, there is a similar one in Asia, and it's a company called Grab. It's actually in Southeast Asia. You guys may not know it. But Grab, what they did was they went out and do this uh, whole taxi service and things like that. But what they then go about doing is they say, okay, in some countries, taxi services are not cars, they're motorbikes. So when they look around, they say, hey, the poor guy that's on the construction site, that's earning a hundred bucks 
US a month. He's got to be at his construction site from seven to seven. There's no time to spend time with his family, probably no medical insurance. You know what they did? They says, okay, I'm gonna recruit drivers, but I know you guys do not have uh, money for uh, a, a, a smartphone. What I'll do is I'll negotiate with the smartphone suppliers and I'll sell it to you or I rent it to you for a cost. Next thing they say is, I'm a company, so I can buy bulk medical insurance. I can bulk, I can give you the insurance too. They then go about and says, you need to, you need a vehicle. Don't worry. One of my investors is Honda. <laughs> the bulk by the bikes and through time to kind of like a, a higher purchase type format eventually you own it to me that has more social impact and the guy is earning 200 dollars a month mm -hmm. and he's got flexibility and then you know what they did they went into the food business food delivery because he says in the morning i deliver people to work and then i'm twiddling thumbs can I deliver documents? Can I deliver food? Can I deliver all the other things? So this guy's day is full. It's not just shuffling people around. And in some countries like Jakarta, traffic jam is so bad that if you drive a car, God bless you. You never get to your destination. But to a motorbike, you can get to your destination. So in that company called Grab, it's not just a a taxi hiring service is also a social uh, it's also a finance company it's also a, 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 a bike leasing company <laughs> and, it's, and the, com the the countries welcome this because you're solving their social and employment problem hmm. wow it's five companies in one yeah and that's how models will evolve and to me, that's more profitable than your traditional model. You're, you're mentioning there, sorry, Kyo, that, that picks up on, on the next question, which is, um, do you, these prospects that excite you, is that something that you see being picked up across the venture capital community? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because people see that. And, and people beginning to see, wow, this company or this business is not just one. They start with one and then they permit through different spheres. So therefore, the other situation, um, particularly in the Asian context where uh, there is no, what you call legacy, the crossing of industries becomes a very interesting play. So like, for instance, if you look at Tesla, Tesla is not an automobile company. Everybody thinks it's an automobile company. To me, it's an automobile. It's just a means to an end. It's actually a software company. It's a tracking company. It's a big data company. All yeah. wrapped in one. Right? And it's that crossing of industries that your traditional auto industries people don't think the way that a data scientist think. So that's why Elon Musk can come in and cut off their toes. And now the auto companies are saying, what hit me? Right? Yeah. Same thing. Like the telecom companies, they traditionally were selling pipes, selling voice. Data came along and nearly cut off their feet. Thanks to mobile, they survived. Thanks to this, this guy, the, 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 the smartphone. Yeah. Without an Apple iPhone or an Android phone, Telecoms infrastructure will have died. Yeah. So therefore, that business, for instance, the telecalco, the, the, the whole control is no longer used to be the telco that controls everything. Now the control of a growth of a telco is actually in the hands of the device companies. Because that is actually where the every time you launch a new device, your growth gets 10% up. And I see that. And a lot of the 
guys in the uh, in, in traditional industries do not see that they're blindsided with the old assumptions. Mm. So we have to get out of the box and look at the different sectors. You get flanked. Uh, you not. As an investor, then, when somebody comes to you with a proposition, how are you looking for them to value that social impact as well as the traditional business plan with the bottom line that you know they would have been doing for the last 10 or 20 years when they're going to uh, try and get investment? How, how do they factor in these uh, social impact values? The social impact values are measurable nowadays. Like, for instance, um, uh, for people, for instance, um, you have, if you're a motivated team, for instance, um, then the, the number of sick days, number of days that are taken off because of sickness would reduce. Okay? That, um, that you have uh, um, what I call uh, issues of like, are you helping more communities, right? Um, that kind of things are now being looked at as even on listed companies. Uh, are they that? And in fact, a lot of the big four are actually doing a lot of this matrix to see what economic value you can put on it on a valuation of a company. And that will become mainstream soon. Today, it talks about uh, putting ESG as a reporting. But in future, it will be measurable. And that is part of the driving factors, because then if right now, to be honest, impact investing, a lot of people think of it from a non-profit environment. But it is not about non-profit, it's about sustainability. That can you sustain first as a business and then make all these new values that you can sustain through. To be honest, if you have a company that is really impactful, your product quality, your services is actually much better than someone else. Case in point, the first company I worked for was Hewlett Packard. And when I look back, Hewlett Packard was a social corporation. Because one of their corporate uh, vision and strategy and measurement of individuals is talking about people as an asset. I still remember I screwed up at one time. I was, um, that year I did everything well. I had all my numbers met and tick all the boxes. My manager says, KO, you did very well this year, but there's one thing you did not, you failed to achieve, you failed. And I said, what was that? One of your line items was to nurture your successor. You did not do that. Therefore, this year you fail. Oops. <laughs> Amazing. And I was fairly young as a young supervisor and like, oh, oh. So that to me is very important because when they value people as people, as a resource, as an important resource, it becomes a very significant thing. So it disrupts and you need to have new ways of looking at things. You mentioned there um, around the, the way that reporting, ESG reporting is, is going to become potentially a driver. Do, do you see the same with the sustainable development goals? Um, might businesses now start to look to align themselves to, to one or more of those? Absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, you have, uh, in fact, one of the drivers behind that is actually family investors, uh, family groups, uh, family offices. They are saying, hey, we are family businesses. We believe in these things. Therefore, we are investing in those areas. And you, Mr. Banker, I am demanding that. If you don't give me those uh, type of investments, I'm not investing at all. So. Uh, is real business, real value, real economic, uh, and, and not the traditional way of like, oh, it's just a number. It is not a number. And, and to me, that's hope. 
um, the ESG is just first step towards what I call the, the, the SDG goals. And for the family group that I'm working with, we are very heavy into looking at SDG and all this other stuff that how we can use that as a yardstick to look at uh, investment proposals, which box do they fall in? Are they really falling in? Or are they just a marketing exercise? And there's a lot of those fake ones out there too. So, so absolutely. Um, in fact, the whole SDG, and then there's some changes under the SDG because there are three layers. You have the, the, the planet, the, I can't remember the economic value and then the, the relational value. And all, all these are part and parcel of developing, um, and it will accelerate because of COVID-19 because people are becoming more aware of um, the environment, um, the relational part, and particularly the next generation, which has a lot more knowledge, a lot more awareness of this than my generation. You, you talked about the the um, impact of family investment, and I guess one of the key things there is the the lifetime that you can look at for return on your investment as a, as a private equity investor or, or uh, a family investor. How how do you see mainstream, you know, Wall Street, the um, City of London, the, the the mainstream markets reacting to these trends? Are they equally getting on board very quickly or, or is there a, a longer term project there? No, they, they don't have a choice uh, because <laughs> if the, the people with the money are saying that, the bankers are, are, are scrambling in some ways to, 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 to look for alternatives. Um, in fact, uh, two years, three years ago, when we were talking uh, to the investment banks, to the fund houses to talk about ESG, there was only a handful of those funds that were available. Today, the hottest class of um, uh, uh, staffing is actually people who have ESG knowledge or impact knowledge to be recruited by the investment banks or the fund houses because they are like, uh oh, we better wake up to this because the, the guys with the money are asking for this. So, and and, and it's quite funny because a friend of mine actually works in London uh, and she says that, well, three years ago I was joined this outfit and now, now everyone is trying to pull her away from it because she was one of the earlier pioneers in, in, in this area. And it's like, man, what's going on? I said, <laughs> well, you, you were up there early and, and that's good for you. <laughs> Fantastic. And you hear that a lot more. You're going to hear that a lot more. The, the couple of things that, uh, that, that will push that, the, the, the money side, the source of money, the source of capital. The second part is actually the, the community expectation, particularly the next generation of investors, like the younger generation, are asking the same questions. The third area is actually uh, because of that, the stock exchange, the London stock exchange, the Hong Kong stock exchange are actually now saying, you have to report on ESGs. Otherwise, I'll throw you off. It used to be kind of like, it's good to have, now it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. And resulting from that is uh, a lot of them are scrambling. A lot of them are also looking at how do I then make a difference? And, and some of the ones are fairly simple, like, oh, maybe I send a bunch of people to do volunteering. That's fine too. But increasingly, it's a lot more getting a lot more sophisticated and how did they built in into the entire business and even the supply chain. For instance, there's a computer company, um, uh, uh, Lenovo. What they did was in the whole ESG reporting, it's not just about themselves. It's about the entire supply chain that they track the ESG of the entire uh, people who supply the parts to them and how they run their companies to your hire and fire. Uh, what is their labor uh, uh, rules? Uh, how do they then uh, um, employ people? Uh, that whole scheme of things. Now, for ESG, G is easy, governance. But for E, it's challenging, but it's manageable. But for S, social, it's more difficult, but can be managed, can be measured. The S part is like labor, 
Do you treat people well? Do you hire and fire? Do you do you do do you rip people off? Uh, basically, it's how you treat your employees. Do you provide medical service, medical plans uh, to your uh, employees? And the next generation of people coming on the stream looking for jobs, that's what they look at. Otherwise, you won't get the brightest brains to joining your company. That is also a push factor that is mm -hmm. pushing a lot of the companies that says, oops, I'm going to be in trouble if I'm not getting the brightest and the best. As an investor, then, do you see the lifetime of your investment changing as you focus more on impact investment in terms of the, the length of time before you'll look for a return? No, no, because it's uh, it, it, when the, the, the key is looking at the model, whether they're sustainable long term, right? And when you're sustainable in the long term, you can almost exit at any point in time, or you don't exit at all. You keep it um, um, forever, because if this job belief, then you keep it forever. You look for dividends and, and it's a sample of what you want to do or use that as a platform to go invest in others with the same philosophy. So you expand your scope in that context. So there's a lot of ways to skin this and, and financial engineers know this better than I do. <laughs> we, you'll be glad to know we've got one uh, potentially disruptive community-based business idea that uh, somebody's willing to run past you in the, in the chat forum. So we'll, we'll be trying to <laughs> okay. pick you up. <laughs> I'm, I'm game for it. <laughs> um, you talked as well about you know, uh, vertical globalization and, and kind of supply chains shortening, becoming more regional. And um, what's your view of, of um, will, the, will the middleman essentially get squeezed out and direct consumer where you can use technology will become the prevalent way, or will will Amazon scoop up everyone? <laughs> um, I I do not think that that's going to happen because, uh, like for instance, I'm helping a a a a, um, a company that's doing um, collapsible mobile furniture, and he is thinking about instead of manufacturing the traditional way of manufacturing this furniture in one location, and ship it all over the world. He's going to create multiple manufacturing sites as more of the de uh, re deglobalization, regionalization, we call it. But his whole idea was to say, okay, I create the designs uh, right at the top level of the company. I'm not going to be greedy to own everything. I'm going to just take a royalty, but I'll create a, um, a, what do you call uh, a structure whereby each region will have a piece in my top company. And therefore, each region will run by itself, set up their own manufacturing. But they realized, then he realized that, ah, in some of the developed economies in manufacturing, most of the cost is in labor. But if I, let's say for furniture, that's 40% uh, is in, 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 in labor cost. Then he says it's not sustainable in the developed economy when it becomes 40% labor cost. Um, it won't be able to make it affordable. So it says, how can I reduce it to 5%? Mechanization. But in make it mechanization, I'm going to be able to train the carpenters of the future, not just to saw wood, but also to be able to use a computer to design, let's say a shelf with two, two planks on the side, shelves, and be able to Pick it from a, a, a library of, of, of symbols and design a shelf and just press a button. It sends the information to, to, a, to a machine, it cuts the piece of wood, label it, flat pack it, boom, it goes to a, a location. Labor cost is only 5%. But he's going to create a school to train next generation of carpenters to use computers, use computer technology to design furniture to make furniture instead of using your hands, you're using your brains a little bit, and then how to run the code or run the system. To me, it's like, whoa, you are creating jobs in that community. And he's not trying to maximize 
in one location, distributed. So it becomes a distributed approach of doing things, very much like distributed computing. Um, and, and, and to me, that's a very interesting model because then it becomes like, wow, you are actually making an impact in those communities that you're setting up all these facilities. And he intends to go to uh, down and out communities and work with the community, uh, the, the city council. He says, hey, if I put this here, it'll create jobs in your community. And, and therefore we can train, do a training school that will train people on computer aided uh, design on furniture making, and then team up with the university to create a curriculum to then therefore train not just carpenters, but smart carpenters. And yet they can go to college at a local university and that collaborative work within a college educational institute with an industry becomes a winning formula for that community. It's like it blew me away when you started talking about things like that. And kind of like, wow, you are thinking like 10, 15 years ahead of the game. He says, yep, a lot of things that says I'm talking about is available today. And he showed me a machine that can do that cutting of wood. Well, it's like, whoa, it blew my mind away. And, and that's the kind of model that will evolve. And it's not my old dumb brain that will come up with this is the next generation of entrepreneurs, the next generation that will come up with these new ideas. And that you, guy that thought about all this is 30 years younger than I am. <laughs> you mentioned Ivan's quote and, and uh, neatly into that whole idea about training and retraining will be the, the literacy of, of the new century. But there will be, and you talked about opportunities in the health sector, but a lot of this unprecedented change is, is um, obviously unsettling and, and mental health is a, is a big issue. Do you see that as an emerging area as well in the new normal where there's opportunities? In, in fact, one of the things that um, um, I've been heavily involved in, in, in studying uh, is that how do you then look at mental health not just as a mental health issue but more of where does that come from is that something to do with your neural uh, side of things so it impinges into neuroscience and looking at the brain um, and, and, and mental health is just one aspect of it but you have other um, uh, conditions like ADD you have other conditions like uh, um, dementia you can look at uh, the brain health to determine not just uh, existing disease or upcoming disease, but predicting your health of your the human body. So all these are crossing dimensions or crossing disciplines beyond a normal neurology or neuroscience situation. I've also seen projects that are looking at neuroscience and look at sports performance. How do you stimulate the brain for endurance? Um, and it's like, it completely blew me away. It's not just one aspect, it's investigation into one area, but have multi applications. And to me, that has become a very interesting play of crossing dimensions of the medical uh, industries. In fact, if you look at um, a company called Intuitive Surgical, the inventor of um, the Da Vinci, uh, the Da Vinci's uh, robotic surgery system. I had the privilege to visit this company uh, back in, uh, in California. And it was very interesting because they have very interesting cross-discipline people. They have precision engineering, they're medical scientists, they're medical doctors, they have software engineers, and they have uh, 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 servicing people that can service all this equipment that, that, that will be used throughout the world. And that's a classic example of really multidiscipline, cross-discipline coming to play. And when you look at um, the doctor that is practicing to use this system, all he does is using his hands, he says, hey, this is how I do a stitch. And by hands movement, the machine able to translate its hands movement into mechanical movement. To me, it's like, whoa, 
whoa, this is amazing. And, and it, it, it's stretching your imagination. And that's the only thing, way you can do that is the fast processing power, the pattern recognition, the spatial recognition that is all in software engineering, software design that can allow you to do the, the, the stuff that I just talked about. Um, and this will accelerate. It's not just one off. It will become even more and more because the processing power of computers is going faster and faster. I think we've probably just got time for one last question, but you, you've talked about some of the big uh, environmental challenges as well as uh, COVID and um, earlier in, in your presentation, but it sounds very much as though <clears throat> as an individual and as an investor, you're optimistic that the new normal, the the new perspective will will deliver solutions um, in sufficient time and, and quantity. Do you feel optimistic? Yes, yes. Um, I guess uh, um, my 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 take is that uh, people will come up with new disruptive way of doing things, new ways to solve old problems. Um, just that we have to take off our assumptions our old assumptions and wear on new things and 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 take that as upon as a challenge. Um, that's why I'm optimistic. The human being the human being is created to be intuitive, to be creative, um, to be innovative. So I have a lot of um, optimism for that. Well, Ken, I think I will jump in there if I may, because we are uh, at the end of, of the session. So um, if I can just pass on my sincere thanks, Kayo, it's been a really, really interesting session. Um, obviously talking about all your views of the new normal, the impact of business models of globalization or deglobalization, the rise of entrepreneurs and increase in impact and community investment. Um, lots and lots to think about there, some really, uh, really interesting topics and as always, you've given us um, inspiration, I think, to go and start these discussions with our students as well. So I know they will appreciate that and obviously with the recordings that will be very, very good to stimulate discussion. So thank you and thank you um, Ron as well for, for hosting and dealing with all the questions there. I really appreciate your time, Keo. Thank you very much and thanks all for, for listening and attending. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, Gail, for staying all the while. Uh, thank you, Ron, for organizing this. Um, uh, we have a lot of emails to and fro, and thank you. Uh, finally, we made it, and uh, thank you for, for being, um, being such a nice host. Thanks very much, Gail. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, have a good day. Bye-bye.